right about now. Awesome. <laughs> All right, everybody, I think we are now live, and right now everybody constitutes exactly two people, but that's all right, and we'll see if people start to trickle in as time goes on. This should be around a 50-minute or so stream, just like last time where I am with uh, Coach Micah Babel here. Um, she is the former world number 20... Seven in singles and number 45 in doubles uh, in the WTA. And she is now currently a coach in uh, Colorado, which is beautiful. Yep. And uh, been so fortunate to have the opportunity to be connected with her uh, thanks to Acing Tennis. And this is the second time we're doing one of these live streams. Um, so I have given her some footage that she's going to be looking through. And maybe there will be a chance for all of you to ask questions afterward. We'll just have to see. If you're very good, be on your best behavior, everybody. So I'll hand the floor to you, Micah. All right. So this the, the pressure moment again when I'm trying to um, ch uh, share my screen. Yeah, hopefully there will be no technical difficulties this time. We once again uh, did some troubleshooting beforehand. All right, do you see it? I see it just fine. It should show up just fine on stream as well. Okay, awesome. All right, so let me just move this here a little bit. Um, so right off the bat, what I think I saw, talked about a, a couple of balls in midcourt that you had that, you know, what you wanted, and you just missed a bunch then, just maybe getting a little overexcited, didn't quite know how to play it. And I think just looking through the footage this time, um, I honestly see a lot of uh, progress right there. And I picked out deliberately a couple of points to show that, also to show how somebody at your level can really move up within, uh, what was it, a month or however long. Yeah, it's been almost exactly a month since our last stream. Yeah, and however long it was bef uh, between, you know, you took this and, um, you know, this footage and the other. So I'll just get started. I'll just let the first very long rally yeah. go, which I like. So this is exactly what we had talked about, right? The, the first uh, thing that players at your level do, they play a lot through the inner third of the court. Yeah. But as this is developing, boom, and I love that. As the um, points are developing, both of you are actually, uh, actually using the angles a little bit more, and that's exactly what you want. So I'll jump back here in um, this point because you did a couple of things really, really well. So number one, I'm thinking that's not the best choice of his, but what I like about this last ball is you got there early, you got there balanced, you got there with your racket back right there, and you did a really, really good job brushing the ever-loving baloney out of that ball because you're so close inside the court, right? So you're so close inside the court that you want that ball, you need that ball to come up over the net quickly and then come down, Yeah. right? Um, so you're not hitting it into the fence. And I think I remembered a couple last time that were woohoo sailor, they were just going, right? Um, the other thing that I really, really like is the use of your leftiness. Yeah. Right. You're just pulling him out, and that's exactly what a player that is a lefty should be doing. So let's go one more time here. There we go. So not the best choice of his, but that's okay. We take it. Boom. Really good racket head acceleration and just angling that off. Um, let me go to the next one that I picked out. And that is at 110. We're going to talk about the, the body language here a little bit later. Yes. But this is, I think, another really good example of <laughs> using your leftiness. Okay. So, no, nope. all good. I like that. I like how aggressive you're rolling this ball back here. Right, this is where you are right now is a very passive court position. Yeah. 
but you still hit it very aggressively. And let me actually kind of go down with the speed here a little bit, so I'm not having to scroll back and forth all the time. You're hitting a really good ball. See how deep that is? And he's just popping the ball up. And you'll get plenty of those, and you'll miss plenty of those. But you're getting the chances that you want. And so you miss a ball, tough baloney. Right? But this is a good opportunity here for yeah. you. Yeah. Ideally, on this one, I would love for you to be a little bit more prepared already with the racket back here a little bit and hit it the exact same way that you did it before, right? Really, really heavy roll to get the ball over the net quickly and have it come down quickly. And again, go to his, go to his backhand. That's your natural rotation. Right, just angling that ball off there. Don't have to be fancy schmancy. Just do what comes natural at this stage. Interestingly enough, the closer I get to the net, the more closed off I feel from that shot. The uh, the one into the uh, ad side uh, on the other side, like or cross court. Yeah. It's 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 interesting. Um, I maybe it's because of just how the unit turn um, naturally makes that uh, the, the court feel a bit more shrunken whenever you're that close. But mm -hmm. I always I always feel like uh, an off forehand is way more comfortable and open to me at that position. So yeah. I, I think I need to work on that a lot. Yeah, that's weird because usually right because the rotation is your natural one to rotate from your left to your right. Yeah. Um, usually lefties love that more, and it's just. Uh, because I'm thinking especially against this opponent because he has the wrong backhand grip, the more you really um, you know, exploit that, the more you will get those half-court uh, balls. Yeah, uh, agreed. So um, let's look at the next one here. So good serve. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> I get uh, lots of these, lots of these. Yeah. Well, the thing is, that's a good return. So on this one, yeah. really, I would say it's not a terrible serve. Maybe it could be a little bit more placed. Yeah. I'm not a thousand percent sure if he's actually making proper contact there. So I think you're just remaining a little too long in this position here. So you're just getting caught in the sand a little bit. Yeah. Um, and ideally, this one is you're backing up a little bit more. To my mind, you're going, yep. There we go. And your off balance is you're hitting, yeah. but you're out of, out of the uh, frame there. So if you have any chance, any control over that ball, ideally go cross court, right? Because that's your um, highest percentage shot right there. Yeah, it's, it, again, from, from the backhand wing, it's it's the same way. that In that case, it's uh, kind of the reverse. The farther away I am from the net, the harder it is for me to feel the cross court angle. It's very interesting. Yeah. So that's just work. And I think that those things, right, those higher, deeper balls, those are really easy to work with um, on a ball machine because all the ball machines now have that setting that they can really roll the ball high and deep. Um, so ideally, put yourself in a more difficult position and not just hit balls that are coming right into your strike zone. Um, so let's look at this point because I really, really like it. Um, because you made an adjustment that we talked about last time. Mm. Um, I think, remember last time you were hitting forehands. Right. Only on this side of your court. Correct. Right? Yeah. I was running yeah. around to hit backhands, yeah. Exactly. Um, and as a lefty, ideally, uh, again, having this opportunity to almost say, okay, I'm going to hit everything that's sitting on this side, and then I'm going to roll it again to his backhand. I mean, every lefty that I ever played loved that play because, you know, there's, I think, between 7 and 12% of tennis players are lefties, and we just don't see you guys often enough. That's why we don't like you, really. <clears throat> um, Understandably, and I support it fully. Yeah, so that's the leftiness. So great serve, good depth. Good depth on this one, too. And this is the ball, all right? You would have almost hit a, a, a backhand there last time. Good opening of the court. I do. I I'm starting to love this play of, of building the point. Yeah. Just just constantly how, just peppering that side of the court with the forehand. Yeah, and look how aggressive you're hitting that, right? I like. I mean, it's difficult to see from from uh, that far away. Yeah. But 
seeing a much lower load there, more aggressive play. I think I had that in mind a couple of months ago when I looked at your earlier footage, it was kind of tentative. And now you're just rolling that ball and get it up to his shoulder. Boom, again. That's, hmm, is he gonna make that forever? Don't know. <laughs> and you get, getting a little greedy on that one, maybe. I think what happened actually is you underestimated that it's not gonna come to you. Correct. Um, and it, kind of sat there right yeah so you had to do that ball and also um, my legs were very very sore from uh the previous day of lots of exercise and so my legs gave out on me a little bit too which which is, which is which is why i bent over yep leg day never the day before it <laughs> um so next one here is you moving the ball around and you're using your forehand there a little bit more Again, see, you're going more for the corners of the court. There we go, moving. And you got him on the run. I mean, you got him on defense all mm -hmm. the time. That's exactly what you want. Anytime you I'm hitting angles, I feel good about myself. Yep. See, this is exactly the difference between a month and now. Yeah. That was definitely a ball that you would have done everything in your power to hit as a back. <laughs> right. Now you're stepping around it and and like stuff, don't care putting the forth the effort of doing all that footwork yeah. tends yeah. to like i've noticed this before uh our first video too when i run around a backhand to hit a forehand and put and do a lot of footwork i tend to feel more resolute in my technique whenever i go to hit the shot and well, this is probably yeah. not a surprise because that's kind of how tennis works isn't it <laughs> a little bit yeah um, so let's look at that. Let's let's talk about that here a little bit. So um, one thing, whenever I'm working with people on mental skills, I'm always prefacing that with, I was not that great with them, to be perfectly honest. Um, let it be because nobody really modeled it properly for me. Um, our coaches thought it's something that you either are born with or you're not, whatever it was. Um, you could see how I felt about 15 courts over. And you're doing the same thing here a little bit. So, right, I'm just looking at here. I know that you're not happy. Um, your shoulders are kind of scrunched in a little bit. Your head is dropping. So what I want you to work on really is a little bit, and this may sound really weird, um, to just fake it till you make it. Hmm. Right? You're a pretty imposing dude. I mean, we talked about, like, there's probably a couple of people really happy that you have your shirt off in this video um, because you're a strong dude make use of that that on a nonverbal level you can send messages to the other person right if you manage to not show anything i'm not going to go and say like hey yeah you need to do a somersault uh right now because you missed a ball and you want to fake it till you make it now just flex um, <laughs> miss a ball and just like go just, exactly just flex and pound your chest yeah of that. Do kinda, you know, the stone, uh, don't make me angry exactly but uh, try to really walk away from the ball. One of my coaches then later uh, always said, walk away from the scene of the crime, mm. go back to the back fence, keep your shoulders up and back. And what we see in the next point, when you actually hit a good ball, right? go ahead and celebrate that a little bit. Yeah. It's perfect time to see that's a really good ball this one was interesting because like i i felt very good about it i it was such an uncommon shot for me for one thing i i wasn't sure if i should have gone for that shot and another thing was like my technique was so relaxed that i was very surprised that it was as good as it was and so i was just basically shocked that it actually worked a bummer that I think your shot selection, I mean, it depends a little bit on how you were addressing the ball. Yeah. Um, so you thought, okay, I'm going to go for a winner. Then I would probably say that's not the best court position because you're clearly right. very far behind the ball. But as a higher, heavier loop, sorry, that didn't work too well. There we go. Um, to then force him off the baseline and as a defense play for him to play cross court, right? If you want your backhand, I think it's absolutely the right time. And I think you are playing it a little higher and heavier, right? Yeah. Ideally, you don't go for the lines. Don't give me a heart attack there. <laughs> um, but I think that is something where- 90 miles an hour or bust. Yeah. 
just go in your head okay well done try not to be too surprised to be honest uh, or at least don't show it let's put it this way um, so let's go further to the next one that I thought um, is showing some stuff yeah and on that note uh, I, I tend to only celebrate like extremely like lofty very good yeah. things that happen and, and so I don't allow myself a chance to really uh let myself show positive emotion, which is uh, undoubtedly part of my problem. It's everybody's problem. I mean, we're, we're, we're very unfortunately happy to show negative emotions, um, and it's apparently perfectly normal. Everybody does that, but we kind of hesitate when it's positive. So the thing, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be for your opponent to, to see it. Just do it internally. Think about that, um, a game that I play with, you know, mostly younger players just to visualize for them how much they're helping me if I'm their opponent, is every time I say one, um, is when I see negative behavior and they have to put a penny and I bring like a bunch of pennies, like literally a handful, um, and they have to put a penny into a pile. And when they do something well, when they show something well, they get to put, um, what is it? A nickel is five, or is that? Yeah. A dime is ten. Yeah, nickel mm. is five. They get to put a, a, a nickel to the uh, other side. And if we play points for about fifteen minutes, guess which pile is way, way, way bigger. So <laughs> even if I get to put a nickel down for every positive behavior, uh, the negative far outweighs it. And that is something, you know, if we then say like, okay, you get to keep the money on the right side, on the positive side, that's when we're starting to actually see some change a little bit. Yeah. Because if it's then a quarter or something, that's that seems to be more motivating. But just to be aware of that, I think, is the first uh, step. That is an amazing way, I think, to build awareness. It's such a great tool. And I can only imagine the pile of pennies that I would have accrued over the course of just this uh, match, let alone my entire yeah. tennis career. Bank, you know, put it in, well, I mean, you're not getting any interest at the bank, but let's say somebody paid you like 5% uh, of interest on that, you know, you wouldn't have to work anymore. No, so at least already, I, like just in like three years of playing tennis, I, I think I would already be uh, financially free. Pretty, pretty rich. So, anyways, let's look at the next one here. So I'm thinking that's a missed opportunity that he had. Yeah. Um, I think he should have come in. I mean, very clearly, he's completely inside the court. Um, so in that one, you're just struggling, which is perfectly fine. And that is the play that I like. Mm. Um, right? He's, again, not pulling the trigger and coming in. He should. I think he should have just rolled that down the line and come in. Um, but by you just staying in the point and just scrapping and throwing yourself around, which is perfectly fine, you're then exposing, right? And you're punishing that missed opportunity by getting that and rolling it off here, right? And then you're ma making that point. Even if you had lost that point, I wouldn't have cared at all, right? It's about staying in the point and just giving people up to a very very high level an opportunity to kind of hang themselves a little bit i know that's kind of gruesome that that analogy and i need to see if i can find something else <laughs> um so I don't, yeah but that is i think a really good uh quality to have to you know it doesn't look pretty which is perfect I mean, who cares right you're scrambling i used running. to care about that way too much and i think that part of me still exists which still is holding me back Yep, everybody does a little bit, but hey, you're winning the point. And I think that is an opportunity then again to really be positive and say like, hey, I won this point. I, I did everything that I could possibly do, right? He missed an opportunity. I turned that point around. And I think that is where a lot of us, me included, oh, I should have won that point, right? I, I, I yeah, why on earth, you know, am I just, you know, struggling as much? I should win this and we're not giving ourselves enough credit so again that's a little bit of a mental skills mm -hmm. uh, there so let's see what else do we have a couple more so this is oh yeah
So let's um, look at this here again. Um, as a lefty, you will get that a lot, and especially with him. I mean, we already said that his backhand grip is not the correct one. He's a little bit too far over in his forehand grip. So if you're getting the ball up over his shoulder and he's not hitting it, and he hasn't on a lot of them, he's not hitting really up on the ball to create a deeper ball, he's immediately going to hit down on the ball. And that's creating a short ball for you. So that is something that with experience, you see that somebody takes the racket back as a slice and look at his foot here. He's turned yeah. away from the court. There's no way on earth he's going to hit a very aggressive ball, right? So at this point, when you see this, you can already kind of start coming in, not sprinting in, right? But you can yeah. kind of just scoot up ever so slightly and be in your starting block, as one of my coaches used to say, it, because you're getting a short ball, right? And then you're not quite as off balance on a ball that could be bigger opportunity for you. That's so simple. And I just, that's something that I never pay attention to. It, that is experience. Honestly, that is experience. If you see it 59,000 times, and you probably will have to kind of see it that many, well, not quite as many, but you probably also don't quite know yet what to look for, right? So that is, again, let's go back to this here. If I'm seeing this, if I'm playing somebody here with that kind of hump of the wrist, I know that he's not in a proper grip. So he can't really aggressively slice through that ball. Yeah, that's like a super strong backhand grip, isn't it? Or well, he's actually in a hand grip. Yeah. Right? He's, he doesn't make an adjustment. So he's. it looks more he's in an Yeah, that's a, that, that's like, I think that's almost a stronger forehand grip than what I use for my forehand. It could be. I mean, I don't see it as um, well. But the other thing that, to me, is a little bit of a giveaway is that the thumb is not all the way wrapped around. So that's also making the grip a little weaker. Um, but I'm seeing what I'm looking for when I'm hitting balls is where does his body weight go? And his body weight clearly goes back here. So it's almost like a formal dance, right? As your partner takes a step back, you take a step forward. And so now you can look at, if um, you know, knowing what you're looking for, if you see somebody hitting a slice and it's above shoulder, you can crouch in a little bit. Got to remember that. I have to remember that. I'm so, uh, something I almost never do is, is like something as simple as watch the opponent. That's something that he's very good at. Very good at. Yeah, but at your level, it's still pretty, you know, you're still worrying about your grip. You're still worrying about court position. Yeah, can, can I make this ball? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> panic, right? So it's just, but again, this is something perfectly normal, perfectly in your development at where you are. Um, and it's going to come if you stick with it. So I like that. You're opening the court. Potentially yeah. a little bit. <laughs> God. Yep. So again, this is, I think we may have talked about that a little bit last time. So you could have already taken over the point a little bit more aggressively, right? Here. Exactly. Instead yeah. Of, I right, just raw fear. That's all this is. And it's perfectly, I mean, I think that's perfectly natural. But again, you see him sprinting here. I want you to come up and try to hit a volley off that next. Point. Absolutely. With your legs, with your speed, I mean, with your athleticism, that is something that you're working on. And if you're missing those, it's an investment into the future. Right? Because you see it, you see him struggling. I think I, I'm seeing your eyes getting big as pancakes and you're rolling another That's one. That's good eyesight. There. And then I do have to give him credit. That's a really difficult ball to play. He he does those in his sleep. He hits those dippers like his, his life de depends on it. Yeah. So that's where you go like, okay, I may have missed a, an opportunity a little bit before. Okay. But also give him credit because, again, from a mental skills perspective, if you can absolve yourself, right, of the, of the you know, being reliable for every single mistake, put it out there a little bit, okay, he did something pretty well, then it's not on me. So it makes it a little easier to accept, even if you missed a little bit of an opportunity there. Um, but that's okay. So yeah. Let's look at I have to get past the, it's something that I very consistently struggle with. When I do 
take uh, take a lot of opportunities at the net, and I have days, which is most of my days, where I miss the grand majority of them, like three out of four, just instantly miss. I yeah. I end up like letting that cause me to have moments like that where I just don't even take the net at all because it's like, well, what's the like? The, it starts feeling so excruciating and so deflating, and like I, the self loathing builds up to the point where I I, I just don't give up. It, yeah. it, it, it's a lot of extended damage that it does that like because it's been happening the same way if it, it feels like and I don't know how much of this is delusion but it feels like I haven't got any better at volleys since the moment I picked up a racket for, for the first time so that's a very deep mental hill that I or a, a hole that I've dug myself when at the net that I have to really work at right now yeah um, let's talk about a drill in a second. So remind me unless I'm getting carried away here because I think it is one thing to uh, practice your volleys, right? Just somebody hitting, you know, somebody's standing here and you're, you know, standing up at net and you're just hitting volleys, totally different. Um, I'll show you a drill that you can do with somebody if you're doing partner drills that I think will help with making the transition coming in and just playing the point out a little bit more mm -hmm. because every ball obviously is a little different. Yeah. Um, it takes that fear uh, from coming in away a little bit. Good. So um, I think on this one, you are exactly what I'm asking you to do, giving yourself a little credit and we can see it from here even though you're very far away. All right, so you're hitting that ball, could have come in. Ah! Well, I'm mad. <laughs> but you're staying in control of the point. Little questionable choice there. I just, I, I don't know how to make those when it's that deep and it's bouncing that high. But again, good rally here. And you're working for the point. Boom, that's the ball that we want. And again, even if you're, if he's missing, I want that kind of forward movement. Yep. Right, so it's, it's uh, I'm getting that, I'm getting that, even if he's getting it over. Um, but there was, I think, if I didn't see that wrongly, a little bit of a positive. Yeah, I'm yeah, I, I felt good about right that. Right there, a little fist, sort mm -hmm. of. And that's, again, it's not for him, it's not for anybody watching out there, it's solely for you. Right, so that's all um, you want to think of. It's not to impress anybody else. Um, so let's let's talk about that uh, drill real quick. So you can do that um, with anybody, I mean, that you hit with. Hopefully you have somebody who wants to uh, drill sometimes and not just hit forehands, cross court and all that kind of stuff. So you have um, player A, let's say that here, and you're stationed over here. Uh, your partner feeds a short ball deliberately short into mid-court and you have to come in attacking the back end and then you play the point out. Nice. And you okay. just do that until play to 11. Um, and then you switch roles, right? Then mm. you start here, your partner starts here, you give him you know, a short ball somewhere around here because that's where it makes sense to come in with and he has to attack your backhand. And then of course you can also play it to the other uh, side of the court, right? So, cause every now and then you have to attack the form as mm -hmm. well. So that's a drill that, that we're doing with um, our high performance juniors a lot because yuch, it's not very, uh, there's no really true attackers it feels anymore. People that naturally want to come to net. I mean, it's, it's the, um, it's really, the exception rather than the rule, um, as opposed to like 30 years, 20 years ago. Yeah. But he can't do that. Um, but those are the uh, points that I have. And let me make the difficult transfer back to hopefully I'm not losing you. You have not sure. lost me. Oops. Are, can you see me? Yeah. Yeah, everybody saw Adora for a second. They saw my wallpaper, but that's fine. Adora is the best. There we go. <laughs> Adora, who's Adora? As long okay. as it's not Dora the Explorer, we're okay. Well, it is a character from a children's TV show, but it's not that one. <laughs> All good. We're we're taking it. Yeah, um, it's it's a good take. You, you def that's a it's a great thing to take. All right. 
<laughs> so what do you, what are you hearing? What are you thinking? Um, so um, I'm feeling a lot of the same that I felt during that match and um, afterward all the way up until now and that's been con like mostly reinforced since that day where one of the main things that has improved that I've been hoping to improve is my forehand overall especially the way that I am using it to move the player around um, and obviously Z that specific matchup um, there aren't very many moments where I'm being uh, just sort of bombarded with pace, and so I have many opportunities to um, sort of face mid uh, mid deep balls that don't have much pace on them, and I can really work that forehand, and that's been amazing for me to improve that, um, and it's been showing, and that's been very heartening, um, and ov obviously like I've watching part of what made me a little miffed when I was watching through that footage and compiling it for you was the fact that I saw all of those missed opportunities that I could have taken the net and yeah. um, since then I've been taking those opportunities a bit more often the last time I played I really shied away from it again but before I did that I was starting to really get some results um, it really doesn't take much, it, it doesn't take many misses at all for me to start being like, oh, I can't do this, I, I just have to go back to the baseline. It's very, it's, it's very frustrating that, it, it, that I break down so easily mentally when it comes to that. You're, on that note, let me just tell you real quick what, what would happen if I were there physically, um, and you'd be any player. Um, you would look out to me, the coach, roll your eyes and say, see, this is not working. Exactly, right. Um, because I've experienced that. Against I could time. visualize that so hard. And I know that I did that with my dad, who was the first, you know, my first coach. Like, see, it's not working. So why should I do it? Um, but always realize how a human learns. Yeah. Right. It's the first you don't know what you're doing at all. Um, and you're just kind of happy to be out there and hitting and doing whatever. Um, then you're starting to realize what you can't do quite yet. And the next step is then uh, to know what you're doing and working on it, you're still not successful, but you know every single time that you're missing that op opportunity. And if you keep at it, that is when you know that you're, you know, when you should come in, for instance, with, with your, in your case, and then you're starting to get more successful with it um, if you work on it. Of course, if you never work on volleys, then it's not going to happen. Exactly. It's just the stages. It's the you know unconscious incompetence, and then conscious incompetence, and then conscious. Right. Yeah. It's, I was it's actually like talking. Yeah, I was talking with Z about that um, last time, where um, it was occurring to me what was the thing that we were that we were noticing. I was talking about yeah how. Um, the the time before that that we played um the very it was an amazing day for me i was playing extremely well and we were having a lot of fun and but the last game that we played before i had to drive off for work i missed four very easy and quick points and whenever that happens it leaves a sour taste on my mouth every single time that time especially really really got to me and yeah. um i started like w when the last point happened i started making all these comments about oh well now Oh, I hate it when that happens. Now, next time, this is going to be in my mind. Guess what happened next time? So I I lost that. I lost the last game um, of the last match I played. The match before that, and it's only like when I started talking about it with him afterward that I realized that. And but then in that moment, I was like, okay, well at least I'm aware now because because yeah. he said that's pretty bad that you're thinking about that but then I was like well actually it's good that I'm aware of it now because it's actually always been happening but I wasn't um, making note of it until now so now that I'm aware I can start to make more conscious changes um, yes, yeah and that's that's something really important so because <laughs> that last yeah. game like uh, I I can do so many amazing things throughout a session but if I end poorly that gets to me <laughs> It is called, and I'm giving you the stink eye. I see it. Um, it is called the uh, negativity bias. You know, that you're... Yep, at, I'm so yeah. strong Natural. with that. Everybody does it. You hit 29,000 really great forehand. You miss one and go like, I can't hit a forehand. <laughs> you're going. Yep. And I've been there, done it. But it's, you know, but as you say, if you're now picking up on it, you can then go like, no, hey, that's not true. And then ideally what you would want is um, to really visualize that you 
hit really good forehands mm -hmm. or whatever it was that you, you that you just got upset about so you have to be it, i almost think about when we're you know when i talk with athletes about it, it's like the you know how you have the little devil and you have the little angel so it's like when little day angel and devil kind of go and you know have a little boxing match so you have to help the angel a little bit um you know kick that guy off because yep they they do that yes oh my god uh thank you so much um so so far we only have one question from the chat um so if there is anything else like if there are any topics tennis related that have been on your mind lately that uh it's to put you on the spot here that you feel like uh you have this platform now that uh, you, you'd want to run your mouth on a little bit i feel like this would be an awesome uh way to have you air out something that you're thinking about or like maybe get a message across to people um yeah some i think um Thank you for giving me the, the platform. But also, while this is happening, uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask in chat. So sorry to cut you off, but... <laughs> no, no worries. Um, well, I mean, I do want to, you know, kind of hype my own channel a little bit. So if you're interested in that, um, I think Sierra Tennis will post uh, my channel in the uh, either the chat or in the description of the stream. Um, so I just started a couple of months ago, and I'm going... Um, I think into it as the only female that I know of. And I think I bring a little bit of a different perspective to tennis. Um, and I always kind of um, feel that when, when I do talk about tennis, uh, because a lot of times, you know, males tend to be a little bit more, well, you just gotta fix it and you gotta you know, suck it up and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's exactly how I do not coach because I'm really trying to help players understand what they're doing and then you know ideally try uh, to find their own answers and whether that's something with mental skills or whether that's on the court um, that's what I'm trying to do um, and then I think what, what I'm seeing um, mostly again with everybody who's watching probably because you're attracting you know players that don't necessarily you know have as much formal training I cannot state how important it is to play matches. Mm. Um, of course, if you're going out there and you just want to hit because you want to, you know, get a workout, uh, that's perfectly fine. But I think uh, your channel and Acing Tennis channel um, has really grown because you're posting your point play, um, and I think that is something that is so undervalued. Um, mm. There are so many people that take lessons, take lessons, take lessons. Again, that's great. It depends really on what you want to do. But I think if somebody is more um, wanting to get onto the competitive side, then it's match play, match play, match play. And exactly how you do it, sometimes it's painful to see ourselves play, um, but that's the only way that we learn. So I think that's, that's really what has come to mind, again, doing this with you tonight. Excellent. Okay, that's also very interesting to me because I think in my specific case, I almost tend to err on the other side where I uh, tend to only do uh, point play and match play and I've st started to, it's become evident, I mean, especially when it comes to most obviously the net play and um, how it's not only um, showing itself in misses, but in my mentality regarding it, that I need to do uh, not only take those opportunities in point play situations but just gear a lot more of my training toward training and uh setting up uh practice where um yeah it doesn't always have to be putting myself in a point play situation and i'm building it up for uh, better use in those scenarios and so I, I think i need to start gravitating more naturally because i i love point play a lot it's probably my favorite thing to do in tennis so far but um what? like i uh, I'm starting to gravitate more toward uh, hitting and drills. Drills especially I, I need more of. Uh, I, I almost never do drills. It, it's, uh, it's just it, I, I need it. <laughs> it's just keep the balance, but you are really almost exactly the opposite um, of what people, you know, people, to my mind, and that's always what I say to, to clients, it's like I don't want professional tennis lesson takers. Um, I'm not the coach for that. Um, I, I obviously I was hyper competitive, um, so I'm really really enjoying working with people who do want to compete. So that's um, you know, but mixing it in um, the drills and then you know just point play. I think that's really really vital. And back to your point before that, um, 
I think that it's wonderful that you're providing this uh, is this insight as a coach, uh, not only in what you're doing locally around your area, but also now you're starting to branch out into YouTube and making it more of a digital international reach. Um, and not just on the point that um, it's wonderful to have all sorts of different coaching styles out there because, you know, different styles speak to different people, to different players, no matter what it is. If it's tennis, if it's any sort of competitive thing, if it's non-competitive, uh, that uh, different sp uh, different people need spoken to different ways. And so I, I think it's great that you're uh, putting your perspective and your teaching method out there. But also something that I've noticed um, when I look at my video analytics for tennis, I've noticed that uh, in every video I've seen, even the ones that include female players, it says that the demographic for the users watching my videos are 100% male, which male. is very fascinating to me. Um, and so That's hopefully... Huh? Does not surprise me at all. Yeah, like, it, it's definitely fascinating. I wasn't entirely surprised, especially because when it comes to especially sports culture, I think that it... Um, is a bit more intimidating for um, for for women to be a part of that in uh, in a way where they can just sort of not feel like there's a spotlight on them. And um, I think there could be an entire video about this, uh, which uh, maybe we can do at some point. But um, and and so yeah, I'm not surprised either. But maybe the content like this can help. Um, female tennis players maybe feel like that they have more of uh, content that's for them on YouTube, or if they don't feel specifically like that, like that, maybe just that they have something that they can relate to a bit more, um, or just more of, like, they're looking at somebody who's like, okay, well, if they're doing it, you know, I think a lot of people speak about representation and they feel like it's a buzzword, but it's important to people. Like people like seeing somebody that is like them and being like, okay, I can, maybe I can do it too. So yeah, cool. Absolutely. Yeah. So if, um, if there's anybody out that has any questions, I think we have, yeah, a couple more minutes. So I'll be happy to jump into that if we have anything. Awesome, yes, we do have a few questions now. We had one early on. This is from Digo Pesquiota. I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, which I almost certainly am. They say, tips for playing consistently well every tournament. Oh, that's a big can of worms. Um, preparation is one. Um, not putting, dude, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of pressure right there. Like the expectations. Um, yeah, I was going to say, uh, not to uh, cut you off, but I feel like one thing that you can do to help that is to rephrase the question. It's like tips for um, giving yourself a level at every tournament that you feel most... Uh, like getting a level where your lows are less low and like you, you feel more manageable about your level from tournament to tournament. I feel like that's the more like sustainable way to approach that question. Yeah, I think so. Um, so what I was getting into is the goal setting part of it, right? So if somebody says, so the initial reaction I have, is like, okay, to play more consistent, to win more, which is usually what everybody wants, right? You want to win more. So that's outcome goals. Um, that's something that you really can't control because, you know, you have your opponent, you have all these other things that you have no control over. Um, what I would suggest is really to plan a little bit more about what are the things that you want to work on and have a more process-oriented approach to it. So let's say um, now with video, again, I can tape myself, for instance, and say, I want to have 75% of first serves and I want to make, uh, you know, 60% of my forehands should be deeper than the, the base, uh, not the baseline, ideally. That would not be good. <laughs> um, but, that's, that's, that's me. We don't want to play like me, all right? Yeah, like, what are you talking about? It's like baseline, no. Um, so just having a more process-oriented um, approach towards it um, and also really try to work with that in practices instead of just having the outcome, oh, I'm, I'm only going to be good if I win um, and I'm a terrible human being if I lose. So in the... <laughs> oh, that's... Uh, I can't relate at all. <laughs> time, that's, that's kind of the, the answer that I have for that. Thank you. Um, so Lee Sulzener, shout outs to Lee, by the way, because I know exactly who he's asking this question for. He says, what are the a best? <laughs> huh? He's asking for a friend. Oh, yes. Yeah. A very close friend. Somebody very close to him. He says, what are the best drills for a junior player? 12 years old. Um, 
Every single one. That's a really difficult question to, to uh, answer because at that stage, age 12, to my mind, I want to coach all around players. Um, but to, I think at the fundamental serve is incredibly important. Um, is it, I'm a, if it's the young guy who was in one of your videos, it's a boy. Yeah. Um, lots of serving, lots of returns. Um, I think one of the most under coached things, under practice things is the return of serve. So, um, you know, it's the easiest way to, to practice. I think if you have somebody with you, let them serve right at you, but we hardly ever do that. Um, so I think that's really the most important to my mind at that level, uh, serve and return of serve. And going for more, again, having more process orientation, um, become a well-rounded player instead of just having, oh, I'm gonna develop a big forehand. Um, if you ask what I think is the most, uh, the most effective way to teach shot selection it's when to change direction mm. and that really gives me the idea i'm going to make a video on nice. that nice because a lot of kids especially at that uh at that age they get a little bit too much into oh i want to win i want to win i want to win and they're just doing what's necessary to win that one match instead of thinking ahead of okay i'm wanting to potentially play college mm whatever it is and that for a 12 year old is still what five years uh seven years almost away um until they get recruited six years um away until they get recruited so i think serve serve a return uh, return a serve and knowing when to change direction and i'll make a video on that so please subscribe to my channel and be on the lookout <laughs> yes I look approve. at me selling myself for the first you're time. so you're such a natural look it's amazing you fit right in. Um, and also, yeah, uh, I think that is, on, on this specific note, I think um, the the kid who was in the video that Lee was talking about, um, when we play, the main thing that was holding him back against me was the fact that he couldn't get a read on my lefty serve. It was entirely the, the return that was making the difference in, uh, between us and like the... the uh, the rallies that you saw him playing against Z. So, like, it was just not him not being able to r really get the point started when I was on serve. So, I, I, in my specific experience, just specifically with that, uh, with that person, I can really back that up. Uh, so, Glenn871 asks, what is the single most important type of serve for recreational level tennis? Is the importance of the kick serve overemphasized? Yes. I'm, and I'm just saying that because I'm seeing whenever I'm Googling anything or it's like how to hit a kick serve, how to hit a kick serve, how to hit a kick serve. Um, the progression that I was taught was develop a solid slice serve. Hmm. If I'm looking at 100 uh, recreational player from 3-0 to 3-5 to 4-0, even at 4-5 level still, um, people have the wrong grip. They're hitting with the frying pan grip a little too much over there is no way that you can hit a kick serve properly. Um, to my mind, a slice is way, way, way easier to, to learn. It's, to my mind, a more reliable uh, serve, especially if you use it more as a second serve um, hmm. than a kick serve. Once you've mastered it, absolutely progress to a kick serve. But I choose if I have somebody who's, you know, getting more comfortable with serving, they use a slice serve. And then we're getting into more of a flat serve and placing those two. And then lastly, uh, go into a kick serve, which not everybody necessarily has um, the physical um, ability to hit it, to be perfectly honest, because you do have to have a pretty solid shoulder girdle yeah. and, or, and your back need to be pretty solid. So Wrist too, right? For the pronation and everything? Please, yeah staying away from it because I'm, I'm more worried about them kind of screwing up their shoulder hmm. than, you know, hitting one kick serve and they can write home about it. Okay, that's very interesting, yeah. I didn't know if I would be surprised or not by the answer to that question, and I, I'm, I am leaning toward no, but yeah, just, I, I think maybe just because of how prevalent the kick serve is, and like, you, you think... 
just in terms of physics that like oh of course yeah the kick serve is safer but it doesn't quite work that way on paper especially when it uh like when you do consider things like physicality and just the pure mechanics of it and like in my case um i've been pretty much exclusively using the kick serve not even pretty much exclusively exclusively using the kick serve for second serve for um a bit more than a year now and it, it's only been in the last month that i <laughs> I mean, I still have days where sometimes just one little mechanic is off and I just cannot find the court. But that's only now is that starting to become far less uh, prevalent and I'm starting to only double fault, only double fault like 10 or so times in three sets. But um, yeah, the kick serve is, is definitely pretty tough. But I also agree with Lee, who is definitely um, a, a huge supporter of the kick serve because uh, I mean he may be he also has an incredible kick serve so he's got that going for him but um, I do agree that a good kick serve is pretty amazing to have. Yeah, it's, it's I mean it's a great serve and as if you know if you're a more advanced player then of course you have to have it. I mean there's nothing around it. Um, but if you go with your progressions, slice serve is a way easier. It's way easier on your body. Um, Agreed. You can't look, screw up as much. Um, and to be perfectly honest, to, to develop a kick serve, you have to have somebody who knows how to teach it properly. Yeah, I, I feel like I've been, st I've also been suffering the consequences of that too. A little bit, because and, and this comes from me having to have to retire because of shoulder issue issues. And not that I didn't have coaches who could, you know, teach it well, but it's just a very, very uh, rough serve on your arm if you know if you have too many or if you're getting too many reps in okay so um it has now been about 51 minutes so uh, i believe at this point we're going to start wrapping up it has been once again really amazing to have all of you here um i'm sorry i didn't put out a um any sort of notification about this live stream happening i, I did have it um set up uh as a waiting room for a while, but I didn't make a video talking about this. So hopefully people watching this in post, uh, I, I feel like YouTube has been a little weird with sending people notifications lately on when waiting rooms are set up. So uh, I'm sorry if a lot of people who would have been interested in seeing this live weren't not able to be notified. I will try to be better about that next time. Lesson learned. I need to uh, always notify people uh, about when this stuff like this is coming up so that uh, everybody who wants to be here can be, especially when it comes to stuff like a Q&A because what an opportunity, right? This is amazing to have Micah here. Like, I, I mean, even if it's not a former n number 27 in the world player, even if it's just somebody with their own experiences with the game who has a lot of experience, who is very passionate about helping people, that is amazing to have offered to you for free and so I just want to once again as always really say that I'm so grateful to you Micah for not only what you're providing me and my channel but everyone who is um, uh, supporting your channel and around my channel and in the tennis YouTube sphere at large and in the tennis world because it's really an awesome thing that you're doing so thank you so much oh, thank you I mean I, I enjoy this so next time we'll do it again um, we'll in a month probably and then we'll do our happy videos and then we'll have more Q&A and all the good stuff that sounds wonderful and so with that I think we'll go ahead and bid you all a wonderful uh, day or night whatever you are currently facing and I wish you all the very best and until next time because to my incredible fortune there will be a next time dream on friends